there was definitely a crisis of confidence in 1923. There was also everything that had come out of Versailles. Obviously, the empire had taken on 13 million new people, thanks to taking over Iraq and the German African empire and bits of the Pacific and so on. But the whole mandate system, because these were a League of Nations mandates, of course, and the manifesto for that, which, okay, it was an imperial land grab by Britain to a large extent, but there was this manifesto that the mandate meant that Britain or whoever the mandate power was had to undertake to privilege the interests of the indigenous people in the territory that they were now controlling. And also, probably more, even more importantly, they had to move them as quickly as was practical to self-government. Now, this idea couldn't really be contained within those mandates. It spread across the wider empire. Hello and welcome to Aspects of History. My name's Ollie Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. And this week's chat is with Matthew Parker, historian of the British Empire and author of One Fine Day, which looks at one day in the life of the empire, the 29th of September 1923, when it reached its largest territorial extent. Now, before all you budding imperialists out there have a sudden burst of patriotic pride, that day is very much the peak, and after that it's all downhill as the empire faded, and after the Second World War, a period of decolonisation ensued, resulting in a loose collection of nations now known as the Commonwealth. Matthew joins me to talk about what the empire meant to both those colonial administrators, but also the colonised. His book is an extraordinary achievement, covering every part of the vast territories ruled over by George V. He's managed to get great reviews from The Guardian, The Times and The Telegraph, which is an achievement in itself. Coming up on the pod, I've got so many great guests and subjects, including Vikings, Goths and Romans, post-war conflicts with General David Petraeus, the Commander-in-Chief of US forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan, got the interwar British Army with a former head of the army, General Dannett, and much, much more. Please do rate, review, and please, please, please share and tell your friends. Do get in touch with me either on X, Twitter, or history at aspectsofhistory.com. But until then, I'll hand you over to myself and Matthew Parker talking the British Empire. Matthew Parker, welcome to the podcast. And it's a, a great pleasure to have you on. We're here to talk about your new book, One Fine Day. But thank you for joining me. It's great to be here. Uh, Matthew, this is this is an epic achievement. I've been reading this book and it is wonderful. I know it's taken you quite a long time to write. I can see that a lot of hard work went into this. So I think about, we're talking eight years, really, aren't we? It is an absolutely ruinous eight years that it has taken me. And there's various good reasons for that. One is that we did have COVID. Also, it's a global history. And as anyone who writes global history will tell you, don't write global history, because it is a huge amount of work. I, I've probably done research for about five books. Well, I should say for the listeners, this is one fine day. This is the 29th of September, 1923. This is where you focus on the date when the British Empire reaches its territorial extent uh, with the mandate of Palestine, I think. Uh, that is the moment where we're, we've got approximately 460 million people, I, which I think the, the population of the planet was a, about 2 billion then. So that, so we're talking, what, a quarter of the population? Yeah, something, yeah it's, it's pretty much a quarter. It's more than, also, it's more than the United States, Russia and the French Empire combined mind-boggling size even though i think many of us are aware of the british empire being a large entity the size is mind-boggling but i should mention that ireland whilst it had just fought a war of independence was still a dominion uh colony in effect wasn't it so not independent till 37 yeah there was a there was a um imperial conference just starting on they were they were all arriving on the 29th of september um, and for the first time, there was an Irish representative, William Cosgrave, the leader of the Free State. And he turned up and yes, he, it was still a dominion. It was still under George V. And everyone was actually delighted. They said, oh, we've solved, the Irish problem is solved at last, hooray. Uh, 
And this is this was part of a sort of general feeling of optimism in many ways on this day. You know, there'd been this revolt in Iraq that had been suppressed. There'd been trouble. Ireland, as I've said, was settled forever, we hope. And Egypt as well. There'd been a lot of trouble in um, the year or year and two before. So, you know, a lot of the problems had gone away when the, all these, the Dominion leaders and, and India and Ireland met on that day in London, which was the most populous city in the world. At that so... You have these Dominion leaders there, and as you say, they're they're all optimistic. But the the overriding feeling reading the book is that this empire, okay, so it's reached its peak, but that means there's only one way, and that's yes. down. Yes, and of course, that, no one knew that at the time. Of course, of course yes, but but I, I couldn't help. There are sections in the book that you know you just I was dipping in and and more in and in and in and and in the end just was t- turning the page that it's a a page turner and the point where I think in Malaya in particular is just this override. I mean, there's Somerset Maugham in there who I adore as a writer, but the feeling you get of these colonial administrators and planters in, in Malaya are, it just feels like this empire is tired and it's in its, it's, it's day is done. I think that's a sort of, the First World War obviously had a massive impact. Before the First World War, there were actually very few places on the globe which weren't part of some empire or other. And then the war happens and, you know, Russia, the Russian Empire collapses, the German, the Austro-Hungarian, the Ottoman, and suddenly empire is it's, it's sort of out of date. You know, and someone said, actually um, Milner, who was a previous colonial secretary, said empire is now something of a dirty word. It sort of brings up ideas of sort of repression of people being governed by people they don't want to be governed by. And so there was a, there was definitely a crisis of confidence um, in, in 1923. There was also everything that had come out of Versailles. Obviously, the empire had taken on, I think, 13 million new people, thanks to taking over Iraq and, you know, the, the German African empire and bits of the Pacific and so on. But the whole mandate system, because these were a League of Nations mandates, of course, and the manifesto for that, which, okay, it was an imperial land grab by, by the Britain to a large extent, but there was this manifesto that the mandate meant that the, the Britain or whoever the, the mandate power was had to undertake to sort of privilege the, the interests of the indigenous people in the territory that they were now controlling. And also, probably more, even more importantly, they had to move them as quickly as was practical to self-government. Now, this, this idea couldn't really be contained within those mandates. It sort of spread across the wider empire. So people in, you know, these, the, the grandees meeting in September 1923 in London were saying, well, you know, what's the empire for? Are we only, is our only purpose? to dismantle ourselves? Are we just a self-liquidating concern, as the Times asked at the time? And there were, there were sort of broader, um, you know, broader changes. Obviously, mass democracy comes in in 1918 in Britain. There's, there's universal male franchise, and there's votes for most women over the age of 30. And this is a great change, and it's a great change of priority for the London governments. When suddenly they actually have to homes fit for heroes and healthcare and obviously huge pension costs, so they really take the eye off the ball for, as far as the empire is concerned. They're much more concentrated on the domestic um, electorate, um, and also there's that feeling: well, hold on, we're we're now democratic, but we're autocratic abroad, you know, in our, in other places. And what really what sort of emerges from that is quite a few concessions in terms of constitutional um, setups in India, of course, had the Montague Chelmsford reforms and in Ceylon and in Nigeria, there were there were sort of small concessions made to some sort of elective principle. What London found very soon is once you make a small concession, then you just increase the appetite for more demands in terms of indigenous people having decisions over their government. How influential were other parts of the empire that were increasingly gaining more autonomy with Ireland, for example, 
Ireland becomes a bit of a rallying cry in in India, doesn't it? That... That's right. Um, you know, the example of Ireland inspires the National Congress in India, and they in turn inspire this Congress is popping up everywhere and organisations. Um, there's, there's a very interesting sort of move. There's a sort of even before the war, there's a feeling amongst particularly non-white people in the empire they've been treated as inferior. And there's a fantastic um, quote from Norman Manley, who was fighting, fought in the First World War in the British Army and obviously becomes the, the first Prime Minister of Jamaica, saying that British rule, the British Empire, relies on a carefully nurtured sense of inferiority in the government. And this manifests itself in lots of ways, in day-to-day things where people were expected to doff their caps to white people or serve them first in shops, uh, and particularly in education as well, where pe- children, you know, families, amazing stories of children in the, in Yoruba land in Nigeria being taught about the kings and queens of England and the heights of the Chilterns. And one one woman who was a one of the very few women with any sort of agency, British women with agency in the empire, Sylvia, Sylvia Ross, she was called, um, went into a classroom and saw 40 small, bemused children looking at a blackboard with Eleanor of Aquitaine written on it. And so Obviously, the, I'm laughing, but it is, it is, it, it, it's, it's almost it's, not funny, isn't it? Yeah, it's not funny. And, and people, you know, people were getting angry about this. There's an Indian journalist I read who was writing in, in September 23 saying, well, you know, these the Indian boys, they go into this system and they're taught consistently that they are inferior and that everything important and right is British and white. And they come out, not Indian, not English, but he is as, as a sorry ape. But people were, were were really beginning to react about this. And one of the stories I tell in my book is about Adelaide Casey Hayford, who was a Sierra Leonean-born African woman, although she had, as everyone in Sierra Leone did, the, the Sierra Leone history is absolutely fascinating. It's a real sort of mix of... It was a sort of dumping ground for people from... You know, people from the Maroon War, we captives who were who were sort of rescued from slave ships by the Royal Navy. They were all dumped in in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Um, anyway, she emerges from this very interesting background, including she had a white she had a white grandfather as well. She's brought up in they, she leaves um, Sierra Leone very young. She's brought up in Jersey, St Helier, um, where she goes to school. She's the only, her and her sister are the only black girls, and she says, and I quote almost directly. There was no racial prejudice at all. Everyone was incredibly sweet and kind. Um, but anyway, when her father dies, his dying wish is for her to return to Sierra Leone. And she goes there and she sees she's got uh, her, she's got nieces and nephews, and she says the schools are just awful. They're particularly bad for women. But she says they just teach Africans to hate themselves and to want to be white. So she sets up and it opens on the 29th September 1923, a technical school for girls in Sierra Leone. Um, with money raised, she couldn't raise any local people. They didn't want anything to do with us. And they were very westernized elite in Freetown at this time. Um, so she goes to America and she meets W.E.D. Du Bois and she meets, um, you know, she goes to the Tuskegee Institute and it really sort of plugs into that whole um, Afro-American thing, which is, you know, really on the rise at this time. It's the Harlem Renaissance and so on. She raises money there and she opens the school my day and she's an amazing woman absolutely um and th- those are the kind of stories that i was really interested in I particularly and this is another reason why it took so long it's because i really wanted to find the voices of the colonized it's so easy as i'm sure you and your listeners know it's so easy to find memoirs of colonial officers they all wrote their memoirs there's a huge official um you know there's the whole ar- official archive as well with all their letters and telegrams but to find the voices of the colonized that took a lot of time and effort and you know, luck, um, and and that's what that's what the book is. It's sort of people and stories, but also stories from the other side of the fence, so to speak. Yeah, well, I see that absolutely. And but one other thing you do in the book as well is you sprinkle in there a novelist from the time that you use uh, E. M. Forster, George Orwell, and I've mentioned Somerset Maugham. And they do give a, um, they do show the side of the colonizer that, I guess you know, if you're reading the novel, life to be colonized by these people, it, it this is just awful. It really is, as you just in, illustrated. So the novelist that you've picked 
do seem to give a, a quite an accurate picture, even though they're not writing history of the administrators. In yeah, these I, 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 I sort of, I really don't make any apologies. I mean, I'm, my first degree was English literature, and I, I'm an absolute huge fan of uh, Ian Forster in particular. Um, and they're they're very observant, they're very articulate, and they they're not they haven't really sort of got any, you know, they're sort of independent. You know, they're not colonial officers, they're not. Um, you know, members of the Indian National Congress, they, they sort of float in between all of that. Um, and, and they're part of, also, they're part of the, the sort of cultural history. I mean, Passage to India was published in 19, early 1924. It causes an outcry, you know, it's seen as a brilliant novel, but its depiction of the English, the Anglo Indians, the English people in India is, is brutal, absolutely brutal. Um, and then there's other people. There's um, D. H. Lawrence is the other novelist that I I do feature because he goes to Australia. He, um, you know, he had his, uh, as I'm sure you know, he had a German wife, and the war was very uncomfortable for him, and he was desperate to get out of England. Um, and he he goes to Salon first of all, where he finds there's just swarming brown people, as he describes them. You know, he, he and he found it too hot, and 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 so on. But he he meets some Australians, so he thinks Australia is this young country. Um, I was very keen in the book. I think a lot of books like the Empire really kind of ignore the the, the sort of dominions. They ignore Australia, for instance, which who've well, just been through this massively traumatic experience in the First World War, where they they didn't have a choice in declaring war, did they? That's right. They would, you know, George V declared war in 1914 on behalf of the entire empire. Yeah, and and it's a really interesting story of how the war divided Australians and they had two referendums about introducing conscription and both of them were surprisingly defeated. So they were the only, they were the only allied power that didn't have, they were all volunteers. Um, and there's also another sort of very important issue in terms of the, the, the sort of insecurity and weakness of the empire. And that is the threat of Japan because in the year before Britain cancels its treaty with Japan, um, they have to choose between America and Japan, basically, uh, and they go for America, which is it's a great what if. Well, they they had. I mean, this is again. This is the, this was being debated at the Imperial Conference. Canada said, "Of course you, of course, because America said if you make this treaty with Japan, it's going to be an unfriendly act because like, Japan American relations for lots of reasons, which are very interesting, but too long to go into here, are very very bad. And so they've got this massive decision to make. And Canada says, "Of course we've got to go." With America, we can't have a hostile country on our southern border. But Australia and New Zealand say, no, hold on. If we annoy Japan, they can land an army of a hundred thousand on anywhere on our coast. And we have, we're, we're so underpopulated. You know, we're sitting ducks. So of course, hence the Singapore base is comes under construction, but also Australia is very, very keen to get population. They want to populate this em- huge empty country. Um, and so there's a huge, massive campaign run, um, and, and they want, they have a white Australia policy. Um, so they want Anglo-Saxons. They want basically British people to come. And there's all sorts of incentives are laid on to go. And I actually look at some of the, because this is, this is one of the few sort of direct impacts of the empire on working class people in Britain. It's really, it's, it's missionaries. It's supporting the efforts of the missionaries and it's migration. And virtually every family would have someone who'd gone to Canada, who'd gone to Australia. Um, but this is really upped in the, in 1923. And the Bruce, the Australian Prime Minister wants, he wants a hundred thousand people a year to go to Australia. He doesn't get that. But I follow the stories of some of the people who went out there and were put on these sort of farms, uh, and had very mixed experiences to, to put it mildly. And it's the beginning of an idea of Australian national identity separate from the empire because of course there's been four years with no migration and bruce's cabinet is the first one all born in australia um so things are changing there and the english are coming in and they're called poms and they're you know they're sort of no longer sort of brothers in the way that they were before which is absolutely fascinating and lawrence addresses that in this in his his novel kangaroo which is published in september 1923 uh, and it's not his greatest work. I don't know if you've, you've read it. I, I haven't. Few people have. It's very long. He wrote it very quickly and it kind of shows, but it's fascinating. His, um, you know, his take on the political divisions in Australia, where you've got 
a lot a big communist party and you've got a, a, a sort of slightly fascistic um sort of empire loyalty group and they're clashing in the streets they're fighting in the streets about the future of australia which i found really interesting that is interesting because um i was talking with christopher clark uh, the historian of the 19th century he was writing uh, talking about 1848 revolutions and and how that impacted australia and one thing i picked up in your book uh, quite early on there's there is a a complaint that the british or the english are exporting lower grade emigrants to australia one in particular who commits this horrific crime and is is barely isn't punished too too badly for it as he kills uh, sexually assaults and murders a child i think that's it... right yeah hoodie foot he was called yes um, yes yeah i mean the, the, and so so this is a long running complaint of australia against the sort of mother country that that it yeah there, there's sort of there's sort of clashing priorities really um, britain i think it had a population of 46 million and this was considered 8 million too many so they wanted to get rid of surplus population um and there was also huge unemployment in 23 there's like 2 million unemployed this is unprecedented and this is for, again partly due to the war but partly due to the fact that the european market for british exports which had been always been more far more important than the empire had totally collapsed you know europe is in chaos the french are in, have just moved into the rhineland to get reparations there's revolutions happening everywhere there's coups happening hitler's marching in the streets of munich um militias everywhere so the, and they're impoverished and their currencies are in you know the, the Deutsche Mark's in free fall at this point. So they so Britain has lost this market. And part of the thought behind pushing migration of British people to places like Australia is to increase the Australian market for British goods. But what what tended to happen though is that the people who were who took up the offer to migrate to Australia tended to be the urban core. And people who, for various reasons, hadn't made it work for them in Britain, i.e. the most useless people. Uh, and what Australia wanted was hardy, rural people. They didn't want people going to the cities and competing with Australians for those sort of jobs. They wanted people developing the interior for agriculture. So you've got this, this absolute fear of the migrants coming in and drifting to the cities and competing with, as I said, with Australians. Um, so the whole, the whole project is sort of really not that well thought, thought, thought through. And for some of the, the personal experiences of people, some of them are absolutely heartbreaking when they go to these, these places in the middle of nowhere with sometimes with small children and the, 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 the project is not well thought through, but, but really fascinating how Australia, as I said, is deviating in its priorities from its previous loyalty to London. And one thing I, I was just intrigued about is it's okay. So it's the date 29th of September, but as you've just mentioned, you know, there are so many things happening either on that day or in the month of September. And I was wondering, this is during your research, is it, was it a kind of strange, mad coincidence that the date of the territorial expansion also seems to coincide with so many extraordinary stories that illustrate that expansion, that peak of the empire and then decline, or, you know, am I being just, you know, this is a, the work of a great craftsman in this book. So really this kind of thing happened at any other time of, of yeah, the I year. Think, I think you could sort of pick out any day in history and find surprising and amazing stories. If you, if you actually, seriously look at that day and don't bring your own preconceptions or your own sort of baggage you know I, I really didn't want this empire book to be a polemic i wanted it to be about people and stories and i was quite strict with myself i mean i remember a, a writer friend said what do you mean you're limiting yourself to one day this is going to be incredibly restrictive but actually it's a it's a sort of good discipline because it means that for instance you know, I'm, I'm looking at newspapers, as I said, I'm also looking at official documents and you come across things that would, that push you into new and surprising directions. So for instance, I discovered a, a telegram sent by the colonial office at 11.15 on Saturday, the 29th of September to the governor of Kenya complaining at the, the news of 
the um, very lenient sentence given after a trial to a white settler who had beaten one of his black laborers to death. And this is this has caused complete outrage amongst the sort of I mean there's there's African, there's humanitarian groups in London who are keeping, you know, keeping watch on this sort of stuff. And so that led me into the whole story of um the, the forced labor in Kenya, which I probably would, you know, would have sort of come to with from a, a less interesting angle than this actual incident, this actual trial. Um so it's really sort of, you know, that discipline was good and it led me also to Ocean, the ocean island story with a fos, well, an island that is almost entirely phosphate is being dug out from under the feet of the people who've been living there for thousands of years. Or, or um, I was looking at their population today, which is I think three hundred and thirty today. Yeah, yeah, um, and they're you know they're they're very they're, they're dependent on desalination plants, and it's a it's a really tragic story. Most of them, um, as you know from the book, were actually shipped off the island and. They bought an island in Fiji for them of Lord Lieberholm, who for some reason owns the island. He's, he's the well, they nearly went to the Falklands, didn't they? No, no. What, no the Falklands thing is one of the, the – there was a series of, of British re- residents, of, you know, re- bosses, basically, of the of the local colonial government. And they they were faced with this dilemma. They knew that, that, that this huge phosphate company, which was supplying um, crucial – fertilizer to particularly New Zealand and Australia who sort of create that sort of identity was a sort of the breadbasket of the empire or the dairy of the empire but they're not actually very fertile these places so they needed all of this phosphate and so the the wider imperial good and of course one, once Australia start growing stuff then that makes food cheaper for the worker back in Britain which is obviously the key market for their of their exports um, which means that the bosses can pay them less, and they, you know, there's a sort of virtuous circle for the empire. But the, but these, you know, some of these resident officers say, well, hold on, you know, this is completely unfair. You're not paying them enough. You're, you know, you're basically removing their, the physical body of their home. And people who complain too much found themselves posted to the Falkland Islands, which was where where you went if you really annoyed the your superiors. It was this. It was the sort of the most dismal posting in the empire by, yeah. by war force. Yeah, not sought after at all. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Burma and Malaya. These two colonies. I mean, Malaya. I was was reading um, at what point in the book was the most wealthy col- or the colony that gave them that provided the most um, financially for the empire. Yeah, I think per head it was the richest place in the world. Fascinating, and this is at this stage where all these admin, uh, all these colonials who, who are living there, are described by Somerset Maugham as the kind of dregs of the empire. Really, well, there was, yeah. I mean, there was. A, I mean, that's not really specific to Malaya. There was a sort of metropole. You know, back in the metropole, back in Britain, colonials were were, were slightly sort of low. They were slightly low rent. Um, and, I mean, Noel Coward said of Malaya that it was a first rate place for second rate people. And there was this, it's, it's a sort of snobbishness. You see it in the Ian Forster's Howard's End, where, which is where there's the colonials against the metropolitan the, the sort of intellectuals. But Malaya was particularly interesting because of its huge tin wealth, which had been developed by the Chinese. And, and, but the real, the real sort of money spinner was rubber, which was almost all sent to the, you know, to feed the American motor industry. So it brought in dollars. Um, which is which is absolutely essential. But yeah, some said more. He's sort of yeah. He, I, I, it's a, a sort of wistful portrayal of the British there, who was sort of they were strangers. They were sort of floating on the surface, and they hardly hardly any of them spoke local languages. They didn't really socialise with local people, and this was almost a sort of deliberate thing because they. What was all important, not just in Malaya but particularly in Africa as well, was white prestige. This was the thing. It was this the respect that local people had for the English people's whiteness, their white superiority, that really kept them from just rising up and killing all the people, which obviously they could do in ice, you know, an isolated farmer in Kenya or Malaya is pretty defenseless. And so it was very, very important to keep that separation from the local people. But it just meant that particularly wives, it was a really lonely lonely existence without any sort of roots and very, some people did there's there's someone in my book who is the leader of the chinese 
um, sort of community in, in Malaya. And he says, well, we need to, we need to sort of, we need to get British people who actually want to make Malaya their home and invest in it and, and, you know, stay here and consider themselves Malayan. Um, and he also said that, you know, Chinese people should do that as well and also Indian people. And it's a very racially mixed country for reasons of, well, commerce, because the people have been imported to, to tap the rubber and to dig the tin. And so, and he, he, he laments, Tang Cheng Lok, he laments how divided Malaya is. And he says, you know, if, if we have an external invader, you know, it's, everything's going to fall apart, which is, of course, exactly what happens. What's interesting about the territorial extent of the empire is that it's almost in direct contradiction to the, the quote from Palmerston, a, the great imperialist, who says, all we want is trade. I've got it written down, you see, Matthew. Yeah. All we want is trade and land is not necessary for trade. We can carry on commerce very well on ground belonging to other people. And so obviously he's he's speaking well before 1923. I, I forget exactly when, mid-1800s, yeah. presumably. What went wrong? I mean, this insatiable demand for land, was it com- competition with other European rivals that meant Britain had no choice but to claim the land? Or was it just a greed? That, that... Yeah, I mean, this, is, this sort of really goes to the question of sort of how the empire came about. Um, and the, one, one of the things that I really learned doing, doing this research on this is how, just how incredibly complex and how different other some parts of the empire were from each other. You can't generalise about the empire in any way whatsoever without making a fool of yourself. I mean, there's some places that are jungle, there's some places that are desert, there's some places that are teeming cities. You know, there's places that have been um, you know, virtually in the Stone Age, there's others that are civilizations far older than, than Britain's. I mean, the Sri Lankan nationalists were, were fond of pointing out that they were building massive reservoirs and incredible temples when the British were still living in caves, which is completely true. So you can't, it's very difficult to generalize. And in terms of how the empire came about, the one really repeating answer is to stop the French. I mean, you look at Uganda, Kenya, New Zealand, um, India, a lot of it is to stop the French, who are obviously are Britain's historical rivals for over centuries. Um, but there was a debate. I mean, if you look at Nigeria, there was a debate between different points of view about how much control should, is, was necessary or desirable in terms of political control, in terms of league, law and so on. And some people, there's a, there was a famous, um, trader, W.R. Holt, a Liverpudlian. Lagos was basically Liverpool. It was, you know, if you look at Lagos newspapers, all the advertisements for the, the trading companies, they're not just from Liverpool, they're all in the Liver building itself. It's amazing. So this is Liverpool, just like, you know, Burma was basically Glasgow um, in terms of who was running it. Um, and, and he said, we don't need, we, you know, we, we, we don't want to take on the expense and the hassle and the risk of, of you know, subjecting these people to our direct rule. But then other people, Goldie, who was the sort of conquistador of Nigeria, said, well, we can't do business unless we have control or unless there's contract law and unless there's law and order and, you know, police run by us. So there was that debate went on. But a, but a lot of the time it was business preceded empire. If you look at the Pacific, for instance, which I, which I write quite a lot about, I was really interested in, in, in the history of that. You had from the 1840s, you had American whalers turning up and you had sandalwood traders and you had people forcibly recruiting labour for the guano mines of Peru and so on. And there was mayhem. And the same was in New Zealand. The traders got there first and the British government actually annexed these places in order to control the very unpleasant activities of European traders. So it was a sort of you know, paternalism. Um, even even way back in New Zealand in the 1840s or the Pacific in the 1880s. Um, so there's lots of just like everything is very complex. Everything is nuanced. And they're all all of these stories are, are, have a unique setting. Um, so if we move forward a bit beyond 23, within sort of 30, 40 years, Britain's going through this huge period of decolonization which is interesting because you have the Duke of Devonshire, who's the colonial secretary on the day that you're writing about. And then I think it's his son-in-law is Harold Macmillan, who is prime minister when a lot of decolonization is, is, is taking place. So I was just so interested in the, um, 
in the kind of colonial rulers was this kind of sense that I got from reading your book that the empire was on a downturn was understood by those leaders who would then be leading um, the country 30, 40 years later. And so were mindful that this just was unsustainable. Yeah, I think there's certainly there's certainly that feeling. I mean, I was very, I was very struck by reading the Prince of Wales's comments after his tour of India. He, he sent out... Um, yeah, mean, he thinks it's a disaster, doesn't he? Well, yeah, I mean, they decided the background to this is that they, you know, all these people, they, 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 they sort of ask what unites the empire. And it isn't, it isn't really business, because as you said, it didn't really actually make um, economic sense to take over Tanzania. I mean, Leonard Wolf, who is a, who is a sort of fervent contemporary anti-imperialist, says he, he does a study of Tanzania and Kenya and says, well, actually, our trade was growing more in German Tanzania. Than it was in so why 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 do we now have control of this place? But the, certainly there there was a sort of growing nationalisms all all across the empire. And I think this is important. It's really not just about the British attitude. The local attitudes are really are really sort of turning um, towards um, wanting respect, wanting more autonomy. But interestingly. This generation of, of sort of nationalist leaders in West Africa or in the, the Pacific or in the Caribbean, they don't envisage actually leaving the empire altogether. They want more home rule, but the idea doesn't really crop up of actually exiting from the empire altogether. They, because there is a lot of anger, there's a lot of, res, you know, respect for Britain and, and, you know, its material wealth and the uh, institutions they quite like don't they yeah yeah i mean there's a really fascinating character that's who kind of sums all this up is herbert macaulay who is a nigerian nationalist and he is considered he is constantly on the attack on the nigerian colonial government for um purloining land unfairly or, or lots of sort of unfair practices that they're carrying out locally but he still, and one of one of the great finds of the research was a letter that a long letter that he wrote to Marcus Garvey in America when Garvey was setting up his trying to set up his steam the Black Star steamship line, which is very much happening at this time. Um, and he's he's full of criticism for local policy, but for the empire as a whole, he thinks it's absolutely the most marvelous thing. And I, mean, I, I just want to read you a little quote. There's a guy called Please. Manuel De Desai, who was a Kenyan Indian, um, and so he'd been very much part of the campaign by Kenyan Indians to have some sort of political rights, um, you know, alongside this absolutely poisonous white settler community in, in, in Kenya. And he says, you know, the, he, his view of the empire was that it promised lots. He says, it's a wonderful conglomeration of races and creeds and nations, which offered the only solution to the great problem of mankind, the problem of brotherhood. If the British Empire fails, then all else fails. No more potent League of Nations was ever founded. But then comes this huge caveat. He says, either the British Empire must admit the equality of its different people, irrespective of the colours of their skin and the place of their birth, or it must abandon its attempts to rule a mixture of people. There can be no halfway. And this is really where the edifice of empire cracks. The British can't get over the the white superiority, which is the big justification for empire. They're there because they're better at things, and these people need our help. That's the justification. That's the paternalism. That's trusteeship. But baked into that is this idea of white supremacy, white superiority, or British superiority, which so offended and annoyed people you know, these highly educated people. I mean, I think he'd been to Cambridge and he'd done a doctorate and, you know, these are, these are highly educated people, far more better educated probably than all of the, the colonial officers. But they're treated because of their color of their skin and because of their nationality as inferior. So this is both the sort of the cope, it's the sort of foundation of the empire, but it's also the reason why these sharp cracks are appearing. But it will be, going back to your original question, it will be the next generation very much inspired by people like Macaulay, Garvey, and so on, who will who will make that step, make that sort of mental break with the idea of the of, of the empire for their country.
Well, I think we're coming to the end, Matthew. It's been um, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I just wondered where you think. I mean, because you you know we're on the hundredth anniversary. I don't think that was your original plan when you set out to write the book. <laughs> No, we actually joked, God, wouldn't it be funny if it took so long that it came out on the anniversary? So, yeah. Um, but it's kind of, but also over the period, lots of, lots has actually happened over the period of me researching and writing this book. You know, you've had, um, the growing reparations movement, um, in the Caribbean and in Africa, which is really still very much, a, you know, a, 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 a important thing. You've had the Colston statue coming down. You've had BLM and, you know, the ground has shifted. Uh, and now you have Barbados leaving the Commonwealth. And Barbados is like the most little England place in the Caribbean. You know, I know well. Um, and it's astonishing. That, and so it's not just, you know, the British people who are debating the empire. You know, I mean, there's a lot published, as you know, and there's a lot of sort of strong feelings um, and a lot of ignorance, has to be said. But also, you know, it's also um, places like Barbados and Jamaica looking at their history and saying, well, actually, you know, we need to be, this is still holding us back. It's still making us feel inferior. The fact that, you know, our head of state is a, a white guy sitting 2,000 miles away. And you look at Australia as well. They've got a big debate about, you know, the, the treatment of native Australians. Um, and they're also debating, you know, and challenging links to, to Britain. So it's not just here where this is absolutely hot topic, but it's all, all over what was the empire as well. And you've also got former French colonies uh, trying to join the Commonwealth. Yes, or, or wanting to kick the French recently in Niger, you know, kick out the French ambassador and the, the French soldiers, yeah. Um, but, you know, as, as I think someone said in the House of Commons, you know, the French got, the French sort of got the empty bits and the colour blue in Africa and, and Britain got where people actually lived and worked and bought stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's, so it's very different. I don't claim to be an expert at all on, the the what was the french empire so i'm not going to go there well i certainly don't matthew this has been really enjoyable thank you so much the book it's out now so listeners i highly encourage you this is a an epic work that is it's quite awe-inspiring really but thank you matthew it's been a pleasure Ollie. thanks for having me on thank you so much for listening if you want to get in touch with me you can find me on x or the twitter or whatever it's called now or history at aspectsofhistory.com. There's plenty more great history to come, as I mentioned at the start, so please do share, rate and review if you can. In the meantime, thank you and good night. <laughs>